It's an honor to introduce our speaker. I'll not take up very much of his time. I'll tell you just a few basics, and then you can form your own opinion from what you hear. <laughs> As you have already heard, the most difficult part of this lecture will be pronouncing his last name. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, Dr. Pokemon, I mean, uh, <laughs> Pocketat, uh, got his PhD at the University of Michigan in 1999. I guess we passed the night. He was coming when I was going, and he finished three years before I did. So <laughs> that doesn't say much about me, but it says a lot about him. He got through very quickly. He is, his interests are cities and cosmology, religion and agency, materiality and politics, North American archaeology, Mississippian cultures, indigenous prairie plains history and pottery analysis. And he is the world's expert on the site of Cahokia. And if you haven't heard of this site, you're going to have a good time. He's written 12 books and I didn't take the time to read all of his other publications because I only had a half an hour to prepare for my remarks. Here are the two that you should be aware of. Most of his lecture, I hope, is coming out of his most recent one on an archaeology of cosmos and rethinking religion. He's also got a book that he's almost finished on Native histories, North American archaeology in the 21st century. Uh, Dr. Pakatat is a full professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. In my mind, he's one of the best rounded archaeologists in the world. I'd say great, but then he wouldn't be able to perform. So <laughs> He's got one of the best blends of field work, lab analysis, and theory that I've ever seen, and what's really Exciting about what he's going to tell us is he has continued to grow and evolve and learn after he got out of school. So there's no end to his interest and what he, he can tell us. Now, we're going to have a question and answer period after this, and I would hope that you would restrain your questions to things which are within his area of expertise. And if you don't know what that means, that's good news. So I will, with that, Introduction, I let you talk. I'll let him talk. Thanks. <clears throat> I am Dr. Pokey uh, Pocketat. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's all sorts of things you can do with that name, and, and they have all been done before in the past. So, um, I will get to a more freeform part of this after I, I leave with a little bit more of a formal introduction. Uh, and first, I wanted to ask if there are any historians in the audience. Only one. That's good. So there's only one person to possibly take offense at this first line. And I don't mean it offensively. It's basically that history is too important to be left to historians, um, or perhaps to any group of people. Um, it's archaeology's triple purpose to explain history, to consider its heritage implications uh, for the present, and to mobilize both of those things for the future. In fact, that my good friend Ken Sassman is now talking about something he calls futurology, where he's using archaeology, the deep past, to understand sea level rise. My purpose here today is primarily explanation. There are big questions out there, big questions of human history that most of us grapple with or will grapple with and that I've always believed that archaeology can answer, <clears throat> and at least within the constraints of our own positions in history. And that, in fact, uh, maybe only archaeologists can answer effectively. Who else can bring multiple lines of material, spatial, and phenomenal evidence to bear on these um, big causal questions? One of those questions, asked in various ways since at least the Enlightenment, concerns the relationship of religion and civilization. How did one affect the other? A good question, especially if we recognize, as do many Native Americans, that religion is what you do, not necessarily just what you believe, and how you live with respect to other powers out there. 
Recently, there's been a theoretical turn in archaeology. Uh, we've been talking about it this afternoon. A turn rooted in principles of materiality and agency, which I won't go into. These hold that things, spaces, bodies are active in bringing about change. And at the same time that we turn that way, we've been turning away from modernist separations of mind and body, um, culture and practice, or even structure and agency. No more should we be uh, see imagery, objects, or landscapes as inert representations, materializations, or mere enactments of structured meanings, schemas, beliefs, etc. Let's see here now. Hopefully this is, nope, that is the pointer. Top button? Or not? No. Middle button, of course. There, side to side, yeah. <clears throat> also, pardon me, I have a cold, and so I may be doing this more than once. Um, emphasis needs instead to be placed on the ways relationships are created, and then how those relationships are mediated by imagery, objects, people, memories, places, other organisms, substances, phenomena, and other non-human forces. Mediation, twisting the words of Bruno Latour some, is power. The power to affect historical change. And from the vantage points of a couple of well-known Lakota um, priests, uh, like Black Elk um, or Slobo in this slide, mediators are powers, be they human beings, rain clouds, or spirits resident in things, places, or say a moving celestial object like the moon. Powerful mediators were known as medicine among many Native North Americans. American Indian animic ontologies, that is, uh, diverse ways of being in and relating to the world, uh, 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 ways of mediating the powers out there confirm the importance of assuming a relational approach to the past, especially with regard to how non-human entities, places, elements, phenomena, etc., are engaged. Many are animate uh, for, for Native Americans, so to speak. Or a more accurate way of saying this is that many could be animated such that they would then mediate the world of people and otherworldly powers. This was a phenomenon, in fact, that, that was commonly described as witnessing among Eastern Woodlands and Plains Indians um, at contact. That which was animated acted as a virtual portal, allowing higher powers to see, that is to say, to witness, uh, that which people were doing. Kind of a scary phenomenon, in fact. If you're not careful what you're doing in front of these, uh, in these moments. The mid, uh, midday uh, wigwams or tents used by Great Lakes peoples are good examples. These are the shaking tents where people would go in and would greet or would meet spirits through the portal and the shaking was the spirits engaging the people. Medicine bundles are even better examples. Uh, they are wrapped sacred objects. It's a whole set of things inside this uh, package here. They were understood to be living persons. These were thought to be actual people uh, you would talk to and bring food to and, and engage in other ways. And interestingly, all important happenings and all important ceremonies were bundled. They each had a bundle like this. Uh, and that everything that was done was tethered to the opening of this bundle, which then was sort of the animating of that space. This is much like the opening of, say, the Ark of the Covenant among the Hebrews, which is, in fact, the way that some of the ethnographers referred to these bundles and described them by making those references. A lot of power, and we all know what happens from Raiders of the Lost Ark if you don't control the opening of the bundle. Uh, it's not pretty, and that these were, um, these were treated similarly. All right, <clears throat> so my big question from all this, how does one get civilization out of this, uh, a city? an emergent religious orthodoxy or just a dense population. So this is the next part of the talk where I'm going to walk you through some of the archaeology that we're doing now around, in and around the city of Cahokia, which is really the only, um, maybe I should stick next to the mic, the only uh, native city uh, east, northeast of the Rio Grande. Right? And maybe if you push, you might say north of Mesoamerica. Um, it was a singular phenomenon. It changed the world. And much of what we think we know about the history of the Eastern Woodlands, especially pre-contact, but even up through colonial periods, hinges on what happened in, in, in Greater Cahokia. Now, you might think it was so important. Why have a lot of you never heard of it? 
In fact, why is there no native accounts of this place? The only possible account that was ever recorded, and it wasn't recorded very well, was um, by a Pawnee scout who worked for and was later killed by Coronado in his first expedition up looking for the great city of Kivira. And they make it up to where the Pawnee homeland is. The Pawnee may be descendants of, some descendants of Cahokia, near, on the Missouri, near the Missouri River. I read this and I think that might be the one uh, account or the one mention of this ancient city that had been there. Uh, now, Cahokia develops late in the history of the world, uh, the history of the, you know, especially pre-Columbian world, 1050 AD. Um, it wasn't the only thing that ever happened in the eastern U.S. And in fact, you really can't understand it, especially in the terms I'm about to present, if you don't recognize that there are major cultural developments before, primarily the one that's important is the Hopewell phenomenon of 2,000 years ago. Primarily centered in Ohio, but there's other Hopewell phenomena all up and down the Mississippi, including some down in, it's called Marksville, down in Louisiana. And if you know nothing about the Hopewell, you should know that it's an uncentralized um, series of societies of people who were very much connecting with uh, the, uh, the dead, the world of the dead, through things, through special burial ceremonies and special places. And a lot of the so-called artwork are showing you these kind of um, moments of connecting. Um, powerful substances, crystals, like this upper one on the upper left, uh, uh, psychotropic substances, tobacco, strong tobacco smoked in these pipes, and more. They had special places in Ohio, um, amazing earthworks. This one you can see, sort of get a sense of the scale. Those are houses wrapping around it. Um, this is in Newark. In fact, it's so large, right after the Civil War, Union veterans, 10,000 Union veterans gathered in that for, a, for, a, for an event. Um, they're great gathering spaces that demarcate sacred interiors from the profane exteriors. Importantly, these spaces and all those things that I showed you are not just distributed willy-nilly across the landscape. They reference things. They are gathering or bundling or entangling other um, powerful substances or forces out, out there. Um, a lot of work has been done by archaeological astronomers of the Hopewell showing alignments to various astronomical phenomena. One that's emerged as um, uh, important for, for, for me is lunar alignments. Um, a, a quick pr uh, primer on lunar alignments. So you know the sun rises and sets every year to the north and south um, on the horizon, the solstices. Uh, the moon does something similar, but it takes 18.6 years for that whole cycle to happen because it's more cha uh, chaotic. Uh, revolution around the Earth. So once every 18.6 years, there's a f the full moon will rise far to the north, and this sight line is showing you an alignment to that once in a generation uh, moon rise. That same year, it will rise equally far to the south and then set in both north and south positions. Halfway through that cycle, there's a couple of other positions inside that envelope that it rises and sets. The Hopewell people marked all of them. Uh, it's kind of astounding when you realize that modern astronomy didn't even really note these same events until the late 1800s. Uh, and I hope we'll hear it figured out 2,000 years ago. So that's standing in, in one of those, and maybe some of you have stood in the new work, um, Earthworks. This one is still there. This is a sort of a funky computer simulation showing how the moon would rise uh, once every generation. So great pilgrimages presumably are being made into these spaces, formal processions, you know, major ceremonial events of other kinds are going to be held in, in and around these, these places. Okay, now why the moon? Uh, a famous uh, um, archaeoastronomer of Mesoamerica, Tony Avini, uh, always expresses doubts like the moon. Like it is nothing practical you could get from tracking the moon over, over your lifetime. And it's, it's true from a Western practicality point of view. Um, but what we know of at contact, anyway, all Native Americans revered the moon as a deity in the night sky. And so things were connected to it, primarily feminine powers, in part because the lunar cycle happens to coincide pretty closely to female menstrual cycle, right? All these associations are made at contact 
And what we're going to do is sort of see how that came about. <clears throat> um, so Hopewell knew a lot, had a lot of this, uh, what might be thought of as obscure astronomical and otherworldly knowledge that seems to go away with the demise of the Hopewell, which happens around 400 AD. Right? Um, we lose track of this lunar knowledge. The lunar alignments, great sites, there, we, there are none except now, we think, two or three in the lower Mississippi Valley. One I have highlighted here is Toltec. Toltec begins shortly after this Hopewell episode and lasts till 1050 when it is abandoned. And at Toltec, you have a site of earthen pyramids, 18, like something like this, and uh, arranged in a, actually a sort of a semicircle, maybe even a half moon kind of arrangement. This is an analysis done by a, a, an archaeoastronomer named Bill Romain. If I highlight this, they're not only arranged in this half circle, but they also, um, he thinks, uh, mark a, one of these southern maximum moon rises once every 18.6 years. So maybe this, this lunar knowledge is being bundled and curated at a place like this. Uh, I say that in part because it disappears at 1050, and this is when we, it reappears to the north around Cahokia, which is where we've been working. All right, so by about 1,000, in fact, there is some movement. We also now know from excavating lots of villages of farmers and farmsteads and then neighborhoods in and around Cahokia that there are immigrants. The estimates are based on both pottery and on human isotopes, um, a new study that just came out. A third of the population of Cahokia, and that's probably a baseline, throughout its history are immigrants. They, don't, they aren't born there, they move there in the, sometime during their lives. And so major immigration, and we can track some of them into Indiana, where this lunar knowledge might be hiding out, and back to Toltec area, um, where it also may, may have been curated. <clears throat> At 1050, you have something that is sometimes casually referred to as Native North America's Big Bang. Right? It's a, 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 a cosmic moment when all of a sudden, almost explosive, right? Things are uh, change in a ripple effect out from this center of Cahokia across the southeast and uh, into the upper Midwest, out into the plains, as those arrows show. So what exactly happened at 1050? Um, after 1050, you see this. Uh, I hate all artists' reconstructions of the city of Cahokia for several reasons. They never, get, they never get it right, what it looked like at 1050. This one at least has the right number of houses shown, but it has a defensive wall that it initially doesn't have, and it's also painted green. Um, and of course, you know, our lawn grasses are European grasses, and so these were not covered with grass at, at 1050. They would have been dark earthen colors. But you get some sense of a city of 10,000 people um, uh, covering about six square miles, at least this one portion of the site. We now also know, based on what turns out as the largest archaeological excavations north of Mexico, happening in the last, within the last five or six years, at the little site of East St. Louis, not little, sorry, it's a, it's a, a major precinct of the Cahokia settlement itself. From excavations there, we know that there were three major precincts to this city. It looks like different people and or slightly different principles organizing the three parts, all in this area of about eight, eight uh, kilometers from end to end, covering, you know, eight to 12 square kilometers. It's, it's city size compared to other cities like uh, similar to it in other parts of the world. The yellow dashed line I'll come, I'll come back to, it's a road. If you visit there today, it looks like this. This is uh, part of a state historic site at the moment. We're trying to nationalize it, proving really difficult, a lot of political resistance um, to people who don't really care that Indians had a history too. Um, but this is, this is what you see. It includes, again, for those of you who are the un uninitiated, the third largest uh, pyramid in, the, in terms of volume in the, in the uh, Americas, uh, Monk's Mound there in the background, 120 other lesser ones and then another 80 um, in these other precincts, um, earthen platforms. All of this dating to the period 80, 1050 to about 1250, with, a, with a, another 100 years of people but not mound construction after that. 
So a very compressed short-term history, a big explosive phenomenon, comes on the scene with a bang, and they spread their culture all over the, or the religion, all over the uh, um, eastern United States. <clears throat> with the advent of LIDAR, laser um, born, um, I'm sorry, airborne laser scanning of the Earth's surface, we now have pretty good maps. This is just a piece of the site, and we can begin to pull apart the spatial order, which we know from excavations also is um, centered around a constructed 50-acre plaza in the middle. You'll notice a slightly tipped off cardinal. Um, we also now know, based on two years ago excavating into what was long suspected to be an earthen causeway that goes a kilometer and a half to the south, that that is the central axis of the site, and it dates to 1050. It was constructed at the, at the moment of the very beginning. And with a little help from Bill Romain, the archaeo astronomer, we can pretty, pretty much, or at least he feels confident, that what is this arrangement of five degrees off cardinal referencing? Well, guess. It's one of these lunar standstills, the uh, maximum of lunar events. It happens to be a southern moon set, once every 18.6 years there to the left, diagonally, if you, if you um, understand that the site is set up as squares. All right, so Cahokia seems to be referencing, at least in part, the moon. There's some thought, uh, actually this is what I think, that this is perhaps the path of souls, a place where souls would travel from the world of the living to the world of the dead, and that's in part based on the fact that at the end of it, there is a burial mound, a, a, a major setting where m multiple bodies and trenches are, are interred starting at 1050. Um, we've done recent excavations, in, in old excavations of that mound, and dated it and shown how it was constructed. Um, so Path of Souls and contemporary native uh, mythology is actually the Milky Way itself. And the Milky Way, you know, rotates across the sky, and at some point it will be, you could, it contacts the Earth's surface and the dead souls could hop into it and then travel up into the sky. So that's the thought, that that might be what, what that is referencing, the moon and the Milky Way. And there's other mounds that I won't, we'll skip. In that mound and in others, and this one's from one of the other ones, we have mass burials of people um, oftentimes these are sacrificial victims, and most often those sacrificial victims are young women. This is a pit of 53 young women, actually 52 young women with a, an older woman buried uh, in one, one end. Um, and look at the odd angle. Guess what that's aligned to? Uh, almost all of these pits that we have decent data on um, are lunar aligned. So the same kind of connection that I mentioned that exists at, at contact of the moon and the dead and feminine powers seems to be played out here at Cahokia. This happens right after 1050. By the way, this, uh, this kind of scale of human sacrifice is known nowhere else um, north of Mesoamerica. Uh, there's some, some reason to think that there are a few other little uh, similarities with Cahokia and Mesoamerica that Cahokians were basically aware of and maybe even traveled to and brought back knowledge of certain places in Mesoamerica. Um, well, that, that, that uh, association of moon, women's bodies, um, and the dead continues. We now have multiple cases of female sacrifices thrown into post pits, so we add something else to the, to the equation. Big wooden posts of cypress trees. The one that you see in the left, upper left, is a meter across. These were marker posts, right? They were uh, ancestral posts that contact some of the possible descendants of Cahokia, thought that the spirits of the most important ancestors lived in those posts. So we have sacrifices to posts. Um, this one here is a young female, 15, 16, um, looks like her wrists and her ankles were tied, uh, and she was thrown in after that post had been pulled out, which is the common thing. The one here is, is a post pit that you can't really see. It's that gray blob with 19 women, um, close to the 18.6 year cycle, in fact. 19 women sacrificed and buried in that post pit. All right, well, so we have the moon, we have posts, we have female bodies, we have the dead. 
We also have confirming the dead ancestral temples that are often associated with that grouping of phenomena. Here's one that we excavated um, in 2000. Um, this was a very special one. It also has a yellow floor. It had black lining over the yellow floor. It had a special little depression on the floor that lined up with this major um, north moon rise. And there's some human remains around. It's, uh, it's usually what these temples are. I say temple. Most people think you know in ginormous public um, buildings. Temples for Cahokians and for most Eastern. Um, Native Americans were small, um, old-fashioned looking huts where the bones of the important ancestors were kept. And, you know, and a medicine man of some sort would be a curator of, the, of that space. Um, built, like I said, in, in old-fashioned ways with old single set posts and real deep semi-subterranean floors and a few other attributes. In some of those temples, <laughs> I'm trying to give you the layers of the associations of things that are being bundled right, at Cahokia. This is, this is how they're creating this orthodox religion that I am now asserting as what they were all about. Some of those temples you find these all-important um, female goddess figurines, right, up to a foot high. Um, <clears throat> in this case, she's shown emerging from a basket of ancestral bones. This is shown redundantly, so we know that's what it is. She's coming from the ancestors into this world, and crops are growing out of her hands, uh, probably corn, ants, and uh, sunflowers. Right, so she's bringing food to us. <clears throat> All of these things uh, uh, come about f as rapidly as we can measure. Um, uh, in a blink of an archaeological eye, right? In radiocarbon years, you know, we're within 30 years of knowing that this is an event that could be spread out over a generation. Um, with those associations I just showed you also come a whole set of new religious buildings. They don't have big buildings. All those council houses in the lower left are, are fairly large. Those would be 50 to 60 square meters, I think, ish. Uh, and there's some other me medicine lodges. These things we now think these little alcoves are for storing the actual wrapped bundles of the, uh, um, you know, the animate beings. Um, there's sweat lodges or special council buildings uh, like the uh, midday structures that I mentioned at the beginning. And then there's other storage houses and then regular houses in the upper, upper right. All come in 1050. When Cahokia collapses, these all go away as if it's, it's intended for a specific set of purposes. And without this whole system up and running, these things are meaningless. Um, I haven't shown you a picture of, a, of what one of these buildings would look like. Because, of course, you know, they're pole and thatch. And all we have today are ground plans. Uh, these would be much more elaborate than, than this uh, crude computer model shows. These are all showing kind of one cutout um, version of a, of a building. But it looks something like this. All right. <clears throat> um, we've excavated hundreds of these. My field schools have excavated uh, 300 buildings of floor, you know, floor plans of that over the years, over 20 years, uh, sometimes more than others. Underneath each one of these tarps, for instance, is, it was the floor of a, of a building with, with midden and other artifacts or ritual associate, you know, um, deposits in association. This is one of our summer excavations in 2001, uh, a while ago. But you get the sense of um, the scale of what we do. In part, we have to do this. Uh, this is now um, a housing development, this hill. Um, we are, in the past, we've just tried to stay one step ahead of the development uh, as the greater Met St. Louis metro area is expanding and just eating up all of the, all the land, to which you're somewhat familiar with here. In Provo. All right. Well, um, I started finding temples, the things that we would say, well, these aren't normal houses. These must be something like temples that are described in the historic accounts. So we started taking um, religion a bit more seriously, uh, thinking that maybe we could say something in terms of the causes and effects of Cahokia. So we decided we'd look outside. Uh, in the same area that we were digging farmer villages, where we have, in fact, we have immigrant farmer villages, there's some, a couple of unusual mounded sites, little copies of Cahokia, but uh, uh, um, different in their own way. 
also in a landscape that although, you, you know, here you are with mountains. In Illinois, this is a rugged landscape, all right? There are hills here. And so these, these uh, unusual sites are constructed on top of these hills, which admittedly are only like 60, 70 meters high. Charles Dickens visited this in his American uh, tour in 1842. He wanted to see an American prairie, and he was in St. Louis, so they took him on a buggy ride, and he hated the whole trip till he got here. And this is a big open prairie, and he describes it in glowing terms and being very impressed. He talks about the tweeting birds and the, the larks and, and the sun, sun setting. So this impressed him, this landscape. Even, you know, if you look at my slide, you wouldn't necessarily think that. Now, <clears throat> the, perhaps the most significant thing is that that, the two sites I'm going to show you, or I'm going to just talk about one, are actually connected to Cahokia with a formal road, a thousand-year-old road. It might even be older. And when I say a road, we really only recently discovered this, rediscovered it. It had been talked about by the early pioneers as there's an Indian road. And we finally went back and looked at old aerials, and there it is. And then we also have done some archaeological work on it. Leads from the heart of Cahokia out 15 miles, a slight dog leg down to this emerald site. Okay, the emerald site. Now that is not a yellow brick road out to Emerald City. In fact, when I made this slide I, afterwards, I thought, why did I make that yellow? Because I'm going to have to always explain that, because otherwise people will be thinking, never mind. Uh, <laughs> So this is a Google Earth view of this road that we now have confirmed is, is in place. In fact, um, a former BYU student, uh, is my grad student now, is doing additional work on this roadway this coming summer, actual excavations. We want to see how it was uh, constructed. Looks like it was as wide as a four-laned highway with a ditch on either side. In fact, this is our reconstruction of it as it goes in. The green is known sections, and the dash is inferred going from one of these um, weird mounded sites to the emerald site. All right. <clears throat> uh, such roadways are known in native North America. They're known in Mesoamerica. Uh, uh, in certain um, uh, Indian myths uh, in the southwest, also in the northern Midwest, the fact that there's straight segments matters. The straightness allows spirits to move along those roadways and people too um, in big, massive processions. There's an, I changed the color. There's another view. Um, two years ago, two years ago, two years ago, we started excavations with funding from the John Templeton Foundation, and we're trying to go back with funding from that same foundation because this site has always stuck out on the landscape as unusual in, in every single way. There's hardly any artifacts on the site. It's not like it seems like they're doing a whole lot of living on the site, yet there's a massive roadway to the site, and there are 12 mounds on the site. <clears throat> um, here we are testing in 2013, uh, doing some resistivity work to find, to test for the roadway and finding the ditches. In fact, that's Jacob Skousen right there doing this. Uh, that roadway goes right to the foot of the principal pyramid, which admittedly is only six meters high, and it's not that impressive, but that is a little copy of the main pyramid at the, at, at the city itself of Cahokia. Um, unfortunately, in the 60s, and this is all too common in the Midwest, the farmer who lived in that, in that farm right there decided that that mound was kind of in the way of his hog pen and thought that he'd start taking it down. In fact, you can even see there is backhoe uh, work into it. Um, the state did save it after he had backhoed part of it away. And we went back uh, years later and, and excavated and got some profiles. And one of the things we see when we look in profile at this are um, what the extreme ceremonialism, the way it's built in lots of little layers. In fact, sometimes in sets of 12. Here you're looking at 12 centimeter thick alternating layers of light yellowish and dark. Light, dark, light, dark. Okay. Um, the number 12 is significant, 12 months in a year. 12 is a lunar, uh, it's a lunar months, right, moons. Um, and then around this feature and, and this other secondary site that I'm not really talking about, we find other pits full of ceremonial debris. And whenever we find ceremonial debris, we always find that lining, that yellow and dark lining, alternation, 
yellow dark. Always yellow first, then dark. And then the burned ash, sometimes with burned offerings um, in on top of it. Okay, so we knew we had something unusual. Um, we got LIDAR of the site, we've looked in many other ways, and one of the other things that stood out is the odd angle of the site. Uh, you can even see here, sort of, that the ridge itself is naturally, um, has a natural alignment of about 53 degrees of azimuth, which is what that yellow arrow is, which is, of course, a lunar angle. It's this um, uh, maximum north moonrise angle that I keep referring to as important. Um, so once every 20, well, 18.6 years, if you stood at mound number five, you could look out across the first terrace of the main pyramid and the moon would be coming up right in alignment with everything, right? This, this alignment is marked redundantly in different ways, as you can kind of see here on the site. The right angles are marked with more mounds in the distance. Um, it's like they're telling us, they're almost screaming it, this is a, moon, it's a site in which we're watching the moon. This site, we now have dated to, it begins construction right before 1050. So right, uh, right before the city itself is built, this site is built. Okay, there's that. There's those accentuated lunar alignments. So uh, again, two years ago, we thought, that's really interesting. I wonder if there's something else along those alignments. I mean, if these are real, you should find things aligned to those big axes running through the site. <clears throat> EB3 we looked at, we have a temple at, in that one building that is aligned to, um, to this moonrise. And then EB1 down there, um, uh, 500 meters or more away from the main mound is more buildings, uh, one of which is a large council house. And, and this is the way archeology span looks in Illinois, by the way. If you're wondering how glamorous it might be, um, <laughs> this is the way it looks. In fact, this is even this is a nice excavation because there's no housing developments off in the off in the distance. Um, they're excavating the wall trenches out of this council house. You can get a sense for how big the building was. You can also see that there's a big there's a big hole in the middle. This is the big roof support post. We determined from the depth of that, which is two meters, look at this deep. It's bigger than it was necessary. It probably projected up through the roof. Uh, maybe it was being used as a sight line, right? <clears throat> so the building, again, is that one. It falls within a meter of that main axis, one of the two main axes that I was drawing. So we, we think the building was on the, on the line, uh, especially that's that post. And then, you know, here we get a little closer. The building itself actually marks another lunar standstill at the same time that it intersects the one that the mounds mark. So you might think there's something special in this pit. And so what there was, was a female sacrifice. Uh, in this case, you can't really see the human remains is, is really uh, degraded, um, in part because she had been buried in water. Uh, this hole had been left open. They had pulled the post out, had left it open. A little bit of dirt had gone in. Apparently, a 15-year-old girl or so was laid in, you can see an outline over to the right, right over where the post was, and they let her lay there until it rained. And a major storm washed in, silt, you can sort of see the gray silt coming in, and it's totally swamped her and buried her. Then they finished the burial after that. So this is the first clue of something that we, we are now seeing repeatedly, this alternation of human agency with natural agency. That is, people aren't the only ones doing things here. Even in these ceremonial deposits, they're allowing other things to take part, powers. In this case, the rain or the sky. Uh, maybe the moon as well, since it's got these redundant lunar alignments um, intersecting at that place. We, say that we see the same thing in these little temples um, with human bones uh, in or around them. You're looking at one little one here. Uh, it has a yellow line floor, so they're especially treating it with earth. Um, it's got a few little offerings in these little yellowish pits on the sides. It's aligned to this same lunar maximum that I keep talking about. Um, and when they get done using this building, they very carefully seal it in alternation with natural agents. I say natural, that's not the right word here, um, with other powers. And in this case, it's alternation of people laying in what I call prepared fill, then rain events or snow events with laminated silts coming in, 
sometimes uh, debris laden fills with offerings and, and, and ash inside, all in alternation over a prolonged period of time. So it's heavy duty ritual closure. And then we also have the first evidence in Eastern North America of ancient archeologists as well, because they didn't just usually let these temples sit. They went back to them, and this isn't a great shot, but it's a profile of one of these temples. And what it shows you is after the temple is closed, a series of very carefully laid in alternating light and dark sediments with some ash that used to go all the way across, but at some point somebody came back in, dug a hole all the way down to that floor and um, uh, laid some more deposits in on the floor and, and burned some things on the floor and then covered it back up again. So it's this in prolonged interactive um, experience of people, the moon, the earth, and, and the sky, generally. All that's happening at 1050 in this tremendous sort of explosive um, uh, set of ritual activity. Also happening at 1050, we now know, is based on another excavation that we did for, with the National Science Foundation funding up in Trempolo, Wisconsin, is that they export this, these, this bundle, set of bundle practices, immediately export it to far off lands. Uh, Trempolo, we've excavated a couple of places. We have a, a, a farming colony at this place called Fisher Mounds, about 40, river, 40 uh, kilometers down site from a shrine, a Cahokian shrine in western Wisconsin. This is 800 river miles north. <clears throat> Cahokians appear at 1050 to arrive at an, an unusual spot at the river. Later, French explorers always commented on this. This mountain, in fact, um, this trempolo is, means in French something to the effect of, correct me, like mountain whose foot is bathed in water, something like that. It's, it's a corruption of a native um, description. The waters of the Mississippi surround some of these mountains. Hopewell people put burial mounds all over them, later burial mounds. Cahokians arrive. They set up their shrine at the south end at this place called Little Bluff. And when I say they showed up, they're almost, it's, almost, it's almost like missionaries. Uh, I say that because they bring all of their Cahokian things with them. They don't use local materials. They bring their special cups, which you see, their red painted pots. They bring their chert, their, you know, their, flint, their tool making material from St. Louis. They bring their gaming stones and a whole assortment of other things um, with them. And we know this because we've excavated in different parts of this Trempolo area. Here we found a midden over here, and then this is a Cahokian house that we were excavating the floor of in the front yard of a parsonage, um, which freaked the Lutheran minister out, who was like, because we were telling her this is probably a religious site, and she thought that she maybe had, in fact, been talking to some spirits on some earlier occasion. So I, I, I you know, who am I to say, uh, perhaps. But um, uh, Cahokian occupation, 800 river miles north, um, materials brought from the south and a lot of other ritual materials. It's not ordinary living going on. All of this is happening around a um, uh, hundred foot high, a bluff top, Cahokian mound and temple shrine complex. And we, we actually put a trench into the main rectangular uh, mini pyramid on top, which you see here. Lo and behold, what does it have? It has that same yellow and black um, pattern of construction that we that we I was just showing you from the south. Um, this is a this is the uh, sort of a base fill where they just build it up, then they add the yellow nice pure yellow um, fill, and then it's disturbed. But this was a black layer that ran across the top, just like those pits, just like those temples. When you have a Cahokian, they use yellow and black, and they also will do something else, and maybe multiple other things. We only have one so far which you might guess, it's lunar aligned. So uh, there's a series of occupation areas, and then this is that mound um, with the little side, side terraces. There's even a little mound here and a little mound here that doesn't show up so well. A little borrow pit for getting the earth to build the mound. Um, built at 1050 and lunar aligned. In this case, um, a, a setting, uh, one of these setting uh, moon sets. Right. Um, I even wonder if the particular pattern here, where a central pyramid with little flanking mounds equidistantly off to the side, isn't actually a, um, uh, an earthly version of 
a natural lunar phenomenon where the moon sometimes set in the wintertime with little dogs, they're sometimes called, off the side, little um, uh, light clusters, refraction as the, as the moonlight cuts through the ice crystals in the atmosphere. Fact, we are now looking around and with the help of my archaeoastronomer friend, looking at all early possible Cahokia related sites and guess what? Most of them are lunar aligned. Uh, the famous Angel site in Indiana is probably connected um, as another kind of mission or shrine initially um, built by Cahokians or with the help of local people. Lunar aligned. Uh, it's a half moon shape. There's other sites like this that I'm not going to talk about. It's almost as if there's a moon cult. Like the moon is powerful and, that pe and that, that's at the center of whatever this Cahokian civilization is. Okay, so that is sort of the answer, I think, if, especially if I want to just reduce this to the point of absurdity. What caused Cahokia, or maybe why was Cahokia, um, why, did it, why did it develop? The answer would be, it's the moon. The moon is a power, and that they are acting in concert with this um, supernatural power. <clears throat> How is actually the question I'm more interested in. How does this happen? So what I'm telling you here is it's a, it's a bundled history. It goes back to the Hopewell, and that whatever, in, whatever knowledge was um, uh, realized uh, there and is then saved and curated carefully and then passed along, it's rebuilt into the Cahokian landscape, and that is the gist of the Cahokian civilization. <clears throat> Some ways I also wonder if that roadway wasn't an ancient Hopewell road and that hill, that emerald hill that was pre-aligned to this moon set, uh, moonrise, sorry, wasn't recognized for many generations as a special place. And we're going to be doing more excavations there, and I kind of hope to find things that are older than Cahokia on this hill. <clears throat> so maybe it's pulling people in along the roadway, and these people come for the, the medicine of the moon. Um, and they stay because they then go on to Cahokia, and this becomes the, the place that is um, everything in its alignment, and all the powers of all these outlying shrines are sort of focused or bundled, you know, at. So, in some sense, I would say that Cahokia is kind of a bundle of bundles, or a great entanglement, um, which is almost like saying nothing. I know, but. There's something more that we're trying to get out of the how. So how is this, how is this entangling happening? Uh, initially, it involves drawing on the Ohio Hopewell, Toltec maybe. It becomes this sort of outreach program where they are going to the, probably the four corners of their known world. I bet they're reaching down to Mesoamerica, bringing back some little bit and wrapping it up in this mega bundle that is the Cahokian civilization. Now, the <clears throat> postscript here is it doesn't last. <laughs> 1250, this is in decline. 1350, it's gone. And what replaces it? Other big bundles. Uh, to the south, things are starting to happen. And uh, the people of Spyro, uh, we were talking about Spyro earlier, uh, George C. Davis, other Cadoan sites, they are actually tapping more into what I would see as Mesoamerican kind of reference, looking south now instead of looking back towards Cahokia, changing the whole configuration of, you know, the historical, of history. <clears throat> um, we can even see this, and I, this is an aside, a complete aside, but this is an image from, this is a Mississippian image from Spyro. This is, this is about 1300, 1400. It shows what you never see at Cahokia, uh, Quetzalcoatl um, impersonators uh, with, with uh, sort of star diadems on their head, a Mesoamerican kind of, at least Huastecan kind of symbol. Um, coming out of a crack in the earth, which is also not a, not a Cahokian thing at all to do, um, indicating that these later people are looking southward. Right? So <clears throat> I guess I would conclude by saying the configuration of the descendants of Cahokia and the descendants of their former friends and neighbors um, directly and indirectly shaped the historical landscape that then Coronado might have heard of, uh, then later French, uh, and others. And to the extent then that this big history was contingent on this emerald site that we're working at, this special hill, is the extent to which everything, all of history, at least a lot, big chunk of it, is mediated by the moon. Thanks.
And now, you know, uh, uh, David said that I, I could uh, I would take questions, and I'm happy to do that. In fact, you know, I, you can't, I leave out lots of stuff in this, and so there's little things I'm sure you want to know. Or maybe not. <laughs> We've got two. I'll take the one. Uh, yes, you in the front. We've got the pottery from south, southwestern Indiana around that in Angel site area that I was talking about. We've got pottery from the Boot Hill of Missouri um, and some of the Toltec material. So for, that is uh, three, 400 kilometers away um, or so. Um, we suspect that there, it's mostly then within that um, catchment, you know, within three or 400 kilometers. There's a few plains people, uh, plains pots anyway, probably showing up. Um, and then there's a few deep southern um, pots. The other thing that we have that I'd mention is we now have really good evidence that they are part of the whole Cahokia rituality was drinking the black drink, which is a holly-based tea, high-caffeinated tea. Uh, I've made my students consume it. I didn't make them. They wanted to consume it. <laughs> and, and it gives you quite a jolt. Um, and they're consuming this in, a, in with, along with other kind of physical kind of um, aspects of ritual, like playing chunky the game. So um, it's it, it's that seems to be part of it. And that holly plant only grows from Little Rock south, um, and we don't have any evidence that they transplanted it. We have no other macro botanical evidence. So we only have the stuff, the residues in pots. So they may be routinely going, you know, be, to Little Rock, the Toltec area, or beyond, and at least. Ex at least acquiring this and, and bringing it back up. And the in-migration was primarily during the, the, the heyday? It's, uh, well, the pottery evidence shows that it's right at the beginning. It's huge surge. But now the isotopic evidence shows that it's throughout the duration. We have multiple um, samples from all the way through the sequence, 1050 to 12, well, 1300. Same thing, about 30%. You're looking at two different molars. Uh, the ones that erupt first and uh, the ones that erupt later shows that the Lot 30%, 33% of the people who are at Odia Cahokia didn't weren't born there and weren't and didn't grow up as kids there. What kind of isotopes are you looking at? Oxygen? They're looking at well, they're looking at strontium. Mm -hmm. uh, they're looking at others too, but strontium is the one that's showing this because you, there's pretty good strontium patterning across the Midwest that you can tr trace. You know, that's different. Ozarks versus the upper Midwest. Yeah. It just came out. It's just published like a month ago. Yes. It would seem to imply that the seeds of its demise are there, right? And that it, it does seem to, when it, when it falls apart, it starts falling apart really only 100 years later with some violence of its former colonies in the north. Um, and then it seems that you start losing populations, so chunks sloughing off. And I would bet that's because they never really were Cahokianized. They always retain links to homelands, and that identity was probably with them. And so it was easy to leave. It, it's, at least it was secure to leave and go back to where you came from. So I think that's where it was fragile. Yeah, it wasn't a city that was meant to last. My, my other question was, why Cahokia? Why there rather than someplace else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the environmental answer would be great environment, a uh, big floodplain. Rich prairie soils come as close as they come to the Mississippi River right there. Then at about 950 to 970, there's a, a warmer, wetter period. And if you're going to expand agriculture into an unirrigated upland area, you can do it under those conditions. And so they might have then expanded at, at the same time these immigrants are showing up, and it just snowballs. All right, so that's the environmental side. Now the, the religious side, I still wonder about the emerald site. And I wonder if that isn't. Maybe there's a series of them, and we know about that one. Um, that isn't the draw. 
and it still kind of begs the question of like why then but if there's a, already a hill that people say that's a special place and there's a road you know going to it um, that might still be necessary to explain at least part of you know why here right. yes Is, is it part of the what? Is it title like it changes with the news cycle? Oh, no. You know, it's, it's what I want to do. And so this next grant that I am waiting to hear from, uh, we know the dates of these various lunar events. You can project them back into time. And so what we need to do, since we don't have dendrochronology, which is what we need, if we get lucky, we'll find a series of big cedar logs and we can create a dendro, dendro um, chronology. But if, barring that, we need a bunch of dates from individual buildings in a sequence and such that we can at least start to feeling secure with playing around with a kind of floating semi-absolute chronology. That's what we're going to try to do. If we can lock it down just to one of those buildings, then everything will fall into place, and then we can start talking about actual you know, historical events and time in the, in the terms that we're used to. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to start here because you had your hand up a lot, and we'll go that way, and I know I'll go back too. Hey, you talked about the human sacrifice of Nelson. Is there any Well, there's old work that now, that the old work used to claim to say that they were non-locals. That old work is now being thrown out. And they're now just running the, these, these, bot, these burials uh, pretty much now, over the next few months. So I can't tell you, it, it could all change. You know, the standard, model, standard you know, North American Indian Plains model, which you even see in somewhat in ceramic evidence, would be that they're, cap they're taking captives. And that would make a lot of sense. Um, but we also have immigrant families, so they could be simply requiring an immigrant family to provide um, a you know, willing participant uh, in the ceremony. And which would also then mean that those immigrants would have a hard time leaving if the spirit of your daughter is there, you know, in the, in the land. So I, I don't know. It's a good question, though. <laughs> Two questions, but the sacrifices made me think of some Inca sacrifices, uh, especially with the post. Lots are found tied around the post, and those are usually alive when they're buried. I wondered if that's evident in these. There are some, uh, there are a few burials in one of those burial mounds called ridge top mounds where the people look to have been alive, but not the female sacrifices. The female sacrifices are very, always very carefully laid out. No movement is indicated, you know, uh, after burial. So it's thought that they either consumed poison or, you know, met their death in some way that didn't leave evidence of trauma or, uh, yeah, trauma. So. And then that in the layers, we, you talked about the black being uh, activity, but what is the yellow? It was quite thick. We, uh, so far, and actually Chris Van Poole suggested this to me at some point, I, and now I thought, oh yeah, right. Probably just the moon. It's, it's, uh, we're finding all the yellow only with buildings aligned to the moon or mounds aligned to the moon. I'm thinking it's a, it's a, a lunar color. Is that a pigment? Oh, you, literally, what is no, the yellow? It's a it's a mindless. It's a Aeolian silt, and then that part of the country is yellow. Um, and uh, they can you can go down deep enough and you get the nice pure yellow material, and that's what they're they're doing. They're mining for that. And they have nothing to do with flooding. Right? It's nothing to do with flooding. No. I've lost track of where the next question is, so we're gonna. I don't know.
No, you're right. Um, and I think you're right in, in both cases. I don't talk about it, and it's probably more important. Um, but maybe I should talk about it. Uh, it you know, there, there are, there's a, there's a vestige of this kind of practice, or at least it's a, it's a, a, a variation of it among the Pawnee at contact. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, where you know it's usually one young female, sometimes a young male, but usually female. Um, she's given a heavy dose of corn. She's sort of a corn mother impersonator, a goddess, and she's been sacrificed by the morning star, who's a, a male impersonator, and shoots her with an arrow. Only after a really prolonged series of rituals involving bundles, and she has to ultimately willingly go up and be sacrificed, whatever that meant. Um, and she's also drugged while she's you know conceding to this, um, and then she's very carefully executed in a, in a description that's really gruesome. Uh, so I'm sure that's much more important. And then uh, who's the audience? And like who's watching this? And how does that play into longer term effects, yeah, that's got to be cr critical. It's not great evidence from around Cahokia, in part because it's such a, a big region and the archaeology in those areas is not so good. Um, so some evidence of running away and some of these colonies, may not be colonies, maybe like expatriate like settlements of people like, I'm out of here and I'm moving up river. Um, there's certainly some evidence um, up in northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin of violence right at this moment. And maybe Cahokians trying to exert their in war parties exerting their control of the river as they're trying to found these you know, shrines. Um, there's even evidence from other outlier settlements like Aztalab. The, the, it's, a, it's a Wisconsin, you know, a misnamed site, um, but it's, it's seemingly founded by Cahokian colonists or at least people who are affiliated with Cahokia. They're clearly, the founding involved violence and people clearly run away. There's a whole like, halo that opens up around that site of no settlements. And also, there's also pieces of people found, you know, chopped up in the refuse of Aztec. So it's indicating like this is not a good thing for many people. They're not going to take. They're not going to take it. You said uh, some of your sacrifices are headless and handless. Uh, there's some male ones in that one image. That's not a normal thing. That's not something that females are are treated to. That's sort of. Um, but yeah, there's four men in that one mound. There's four up at a at a Cahokian colony of rivers. Same kind of. Ceremony. Um, you know, Bob Hall thought that was some kind of new fire like related um, Mesoamerican like ceremony. Yes, I think. Does Luther's iconography show up? Does what iconography? Uh, Luther's or does show Another really good question. And you know, I, I think about that all the time. I'm, I'm waiting to find the figurine of the goddess holding up the moon. <laughs> she hasn't appeared yet. And part, I think, because she is the moon. And, and it, maybe we're looking for, I, there's not a whole lot of iconography at Cahokia anyway. Instead, they, they build buildings and they embody symbolism. So we have lots of circular buildings, and those circular buildings include uh, now many at the Emerald site, right at the, the entry of that road into the main complex. We've got big circular buildings. Those are only introduced at 1050. I just wonder at this point if they are the, the symbol that you know that, you're spe that you speak of. I don't know though. I don't know. Yes. Um, I'm up there and I'll come back here. Practical question. We dealt, we dealt a lot with uh, at least in your presentation a lot with burials um, in Brazil. So I, I wanted to know how how you worked with the natural laws, um, how you were able to do the burials, examine them, look for old information. Any exhuming that you infer happened before, okay. almost before I was born, but not quite, you know, before, certainly before NAGPRA, 
but mostly in the 70s with the excavation of one of those burial mounds with the multiple bodies and trenches. Um, those were exhumed and those are now being the basis of some of the isotopic work that's being done. There are in place NAGPRA agreements um, with a variety of tribes um, who claim into that into the Cahokia area to, to actually deal with isotopic analysis. The other, the other burials, like the one in the post that I showed you that we had the emerald, she's in the ground still. Um, the state law requires there are a, the tribes to be notified and then the almost unstated assumption is if it's not going to be destroyed, the burial stays in the ground. In that case, she was a meter below the, the plow zone, so she's still there. And the state law also requires that you expose the, the uh, skeleton to make sure it's not a, a more modern murder victim, which, you know, that part of the country, there actually are quite a few murder victims found. <laughs> um, Cahokia site itself used to be a body dump for the mafia in the 40s and 50s. And so you still, like, you work there, you hear stories from old timers come through, like, oh yeah, his body used to be over there. So it's actually a big concern. Uh, um, in fact, once I worked at a site which was owned by a sort of old time mafia guy. I'm sorry, I, I got to tell the story. And there was a cistern on the site, and he had a Frito Lay distributorship there. He owned it, and I went in and uh, chatted with the guy, and another guy before me, and he warned people not to go near the cistern. And we, we never ask. We just say, fine, we're stay away from the cistern. I expect their bodies in that sister. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. The uh, all that lunar business that I was showing you, we can't. So far, anyway, we can't track it past about 1300, 1350. No, no lunar line sites. None of the yellow black fills. Archaeology isn't great, but you do start seeing a lot of sun symbolism after that time. Uh, and that involves this turn, this seemingly turn toward the south. So I wonder if the moon, the moon thing wasn't working, and it was rejected and closed, and that's it, and then you move on. No, there's a there's a Cahokian diaspora that we have kind of clumsily traced, and, and various um, uh, tribes or nations think that they are connected to. Even their story is a little muddled. Um, some of the Siouan groups in the plains, the eastern plains, claim descendancy, and it makes sense. Uh, there's a few that don't that probably should, and then there's some southern groups as well in Mississippi, Biloxi area, Biloxi tribe, in fact, that probably should claim descendancy. The Chickasaw might even be partially descended, but what happens when this starts breaking up is it, it falls apart in pieces. So you have groups moving off, probably joining up with other groups and then forming new ethnicities you know, in, in other areas and either intentionally forgetting the story of this great place, um, sort of suppressing it, or for whatever reason, the memory somehow gets fritters away. Uh, the original excavations looked for that uh, in the 70s, and uh, their methods weren't always that great, and so and a lot of those burials were lost, so I can't say that we, we don't know. There's no evidence that we know of. There's no separated vertebra. You know, uh, they could have been strangled. That was something that the Mississippians did at contact with the French. Certainly could have drank poison. There's no physical trauma, though, on the bodies. One of the original analysts, Jerry Rose, who's at Arkansas, actually thought that most of the female um, skeletons had very few um, uh, signs of any kind of uh, disease, you know, or uh, deformity of any kind, so that maybe this was a very a culled kind of population. It's even been said in print that like Cahokia seems obsessed with the feminine side of things. Later Mississippians are obsessed with the masculine side of things. At contact, you know, both female and male stories are, re are recorded, 
But when you're talking looking at landscapes and you know, artwork, uh, Cahokia um, really dip, uh, uh, plays up the goddess side of the, of the story. Uh, interestingly, you know, those carved statuettes that I was showing you, I showed you only a couple of female ones. There's, there's male ones as well, carved at Cahokia, but they don't end their lives at Cahokia. They are distributed to the south mostly, from Spiro all the way to Alabama, some up in, our, in Wisconsin. So it's okay for the masculine carvings to be kind of given away or to be taken away. The feminine ones stay buried in temples. Sun with femaleness. I mean, there uh, may be something, but uh, not that I'm not thinking of that, that you are, but not. It's kind of redundant. So it's a co-association. So maybe you're thinking about. Uh, I don't know what. But certainly, if you know female leaders, and you know, and, and later, like the sun is the big, the big emphasis, no matter what. I'll, I'll kind of think of something afterwards, and I go, oh. Oh, it's matrilineal, matrifocal kind of, sure, yeah. But still, the masculine, I mean, the men of the matril lines are the ones who are mostly in charge of, of those practices. Um, so, and so in artwork, it's masculine imagery, you know, and the connection. I think yes is the answer. Um, I mean, I, I can't just say just just women, but certainly women are holding the power. Women include some of the founding figures as now being interpreted as some of the burial burials. I, I didn't talk about this. There's the famous falcon or beaded burial, supposedly of two men buried on top of each other in a falcon cave. Well, it turns out, bi bioarchaeologists just went back. The one underneath is an, an elderly female. So the so the the first body into this elaborate ceremony is an old woman. And she's then paired with an old man, and then there's another man and woman nearby, and a bundle of a man and a woman. So it's like it's, uh, there's clearly a reference to, I think, women. And, and you know, historically, the matrilineal pattern is so strong across the South and the Midwest. It's hard not to imagine that these are mostly emphasizing that, that side of their relationships. No, it's, um, uh, you've seen images of Lewis and Clark going up the river or like paintings of like scaffolds. That's what we have here. So most people are placed on scaffolds. We even have some of the foundations of the scaffolds on bluffs along the river. Uh, then they, after their, their bones are collected, sometimes they're bundled and, and buried in pits. But for, for a region that had, let's say, a one time 20, 30,000 people, maybe more, total number of Human remains, individuals excavated ever cannot exceed a thousand. I mean, I think it's probably in the low hundreds if you went to just count them all up. So they're they're clearly disposing of bodies in a way that aren't being recovered by archaeologists. And you don't think that they would be dead if they were taken someplace else? Um, no, no. I think I mean. Leaving to be buried someplace else? Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think the. Um, um, Cahokia is an important burial place for important people. I don't imagine, I mean, I have no evidence, no reason to think that they're, they'd be going someplace else to be buried. Uh, that burial sounds like an ancestral prayer. That's what I heard. Like about the ancestor burial. It's scary, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And it just took somebody to go back and look and resex the bodies. Knowing what we know now, and yes. Well, that's what I was going to ask. You talk about people going back. So those bodies haven't been repatriated from these early excavations. Not, not yet. Still, uh, not yet. I mean, there's been some repatriation. Um, I can't tell you exactly why certain groups haven't moved. <laughs> I, 
I, I um, but yeah, no, not yet. Uh, and there's a even willingness and interest in the Kuapua, for instance, are interested in knowing who are these people. And so they are supporting, or at least have in the past, supporting isotopic DNA kinds of studies. And also, one, one more, and also uh, uh, Osage, who might be descended, visited the big excavation, really supported the idea of a uh, multi-ethnic polyglot city of multiple peoples. Um, so I think there's a sense of, yeah, that's what it was, and it's, it's all of ours, not just one group's. And so that whole who's going to get the bones is probably a little bit problematic for, for native descendants. Did you, is there a hand up? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, should, I should let it go first. You talk about the great big boom in 1050, but there were probably a couple other booms earlier, such as Poverty Point. Except without dense populations before, yeah. So not, James, not James Mooney, the guy who uh, um, analyzed the ghost dance, you know, um, and wrote a monograph, actually in a really forward-thinking line, says somewhere like, "Huh, maybe these kind of revitalization movements were common, and maybe those big mound groups that we see all over the eastern woodlands were each a, a result of some movement." And I think he's probably quite right. That's what, that's what they are. And in the case of Cahokia, it's, it's also an urban movement. I was just wondering, you were talking about the colors used on the mounds that are lined with the ruins. Did they use other, were there other colors used for specific mounds, or was it just more homogenous? There's types of construction fill. So there often will be, there'll just be like, you know, loads of earth to like, build up the, the core of a, of a mound. Then you, often what, what I've seen, and, and the problem is old, old excavations, bad photos, it's hard to tell what, what they saw. Um, but when they stop and they want to consecrate, you know, purify, or, or, or animate a surface, then they shift to the yellow-black. Although at Cahokia, I have also seen just kind of light gray, dark gray. Um, and I would imagine those may not be lunar aligned things. So there are other colors, earth tones primarily. Uh, and you move to the south, you get reds and whites um, being popular. I noticed in some of your slides you showed uh, floor plans of council houses, and there were multiple ones. And what seemed like a relatively small area. Are these uh, simultaneous? Or no? And when they're, they're stacked. So you, that one slide is a series of stacked council houses and a series of stacked uh, regular homes and a series of stacked, uh, well, the medicine lodges are side by side. Those are probably sequential. Yeah, they're not all there at once. <coughs> I think that might be it. Why no? What? Well, thank you very much. And thank you.